What is up? How you guys doing? Wild Bill, Victor, welcome. Primotus, how you doing? I'm gonna sit behind this giant box. All you guys get tonight is some head. <laughs> With Shadow, you have safe travels, my friend. Paul Ballard, Shadow Ops, Paul Dumb, EQ. Good to see you guys. Rich M, what's happening? Richard Webb, how y'all doing? So tonight, I don't want this to take too long. I'm sure it's not gonna because these FMS planes just go together way too easy. So tonight we finally have what we were supposed to have on Friday. So before we get started with the build, let me just tell you how weird things have been here. Awesome Olsen Aviation, I hope it went well. I, I've flown several P-47s in the past and they've always just been brilliant flyers, so I really don't expect anything different from this one. All right, Shadow, thank you, man, I appreciate it. F.U. Kenny, I, I won't put the birds up. <laughs> birds up. So, let me tell you about the fiasco I've been having with FedEx. So the town I live in is Kennesaw, Georgia. There's a whole lot of people that live here, but if you look on a map, you'll find Kennesaw, Georgia. And my house is within, say, a two-mile radius of the Cobb County International Airport. It's a single runway, you know, airport that used to be called McCollum Field. So we live like really close to that airport. Right next to that airport is a big giant FedEx, uh, whatever they call that, distribution warehouse. It's huge. So this plane showed up at the FedEx distribution center on Thursday morning at 7.28 in the morning. Actually, that's not true. It showed up Friday at 7.28 in the morning. All right, but I ordered two packages and the other one didn't get there till like 10 something. So they waited, they didn't put it on the truck. So I'm thinking, all right, cool. They'll go out for delivery on Saturday. So I get up in the morning on Saturday because usually those messages come in at like six in the morning and y'all who hang out in the Zoom sessions, y'all know that in the Zoom sessions, we, uh, we tend to stay up fairly late. So I already know I'm going to be dead asleep at six o'clock in the morning when I get the message from FedEx saying your package is out for delivery. Well, I get the message at six in the morning. Actually, I get it at like noon. And I'm like, why is there only one tracking number on here? So I look and it's like two little battery adapters that I got. My P47 is not in there. I look at the P-47 and it says it has departed the FedEx facility. Yes, the FedEx facility that's two miles away from my house, it has departed that facility. And it is in transit to Columbia, South Carolina, which is 212 miles away from my house. So they drove this thing. Apparently they accidentally put it in a transit truck instead of the delivery truck. So this thing went all the way to Columbia, South Carolina and made the trip all the way back here to Kennesaw to be delivered today. And I was like, come on guys, that's so dumb. <laughs> that's so dumb. So anyway, FedEx was a bunch of ding-dongs, but now we have it. I love P-47s. I think that this, you know, the, between like the Hellcat and the P-47, the P-47 gets more love, I think, than the Hellcat does. But I think that, you know, in terms of like the airplanes that really took care of business in World War II, 
You got the Spitfire, which took care of business in World War II. You got the P-47, which took care of business in World War II. And you got the Hellcat, which really tore it up in the Pacific Fleet. More so than the Corsair, the Hellcat was nasty. So those are my favorite planes of the World War II era and possibly the P-38, also just phenomenal, phenomenal warbird. But these were the warbirds that really defined like allied air power, in my opinion. So Spitfire, P-47, Hellcat. It also turns out that they all fly amazing, which is really nice. <laughs> yeah, Wild Bill. 19 to 1 kill ratio for the Hellcat. That thing was nasty. Nasty. So, yeah, but I mean, everybody loves the P-51. And I'm saying, like, these are the ones that I don't think get enough credit. You know, they just don't get enough credit for being, like, just badasses of World War II. So obviously, you know, the P-51 was great, the Corsair was great, but the Hellcat, like the Corsair was great, but everybody thinks of the Corsair as like a Navy plane, when in reality, the Corsair sucked for what the Navy needed it to do, which is why the Hellcat was like the fighter of choice for the Navy, and all of the Corsairs were flown by the Marine Corps. See, Wild Bill knows what's up, man. It's almost like he watched a documentary today. <laughs> Absolutely, man. The P-47 was just bad to the bone. So this, uh, you know, I know that at one point FMS made a 1700 millimeter P-47. You can't get them anymore. It's a discontinued airframe, but you can still get the 1500. And I absolutely love the P-47. This is a plane that's been on my radar for a while. Finally got one as soon as I saw them on sale with the Reflex Gyro. Now, in the links in the description, there is a link to all of the FMS planes that include the Reflex Gyro. Now, I want you guys to all know the airplanes at Horizon Hobby that have the reflex gyro, they are all considered to be out of stock. Now, my understanding is that they're not really out of stock, that they're modifying the model numbers because they're removing all of the ones that, that don't have a reflex gyro at all. And these are just gonna take their place because apparently all of the FMS planes that they stock from now on are gonna have that, that reflex gyro. So I'm not sure what they're doing but there's some internal changes going on. If, if my link works the way it's supposed to, it's actually a search string for FMS Reflex or FMS Plus Reflex. So the link should work once they sort out whatever they're doing in the, uh, you know, with their internal stuff, changing their part numbers or whatever. But anyway, the reason that we're gathered here today, gentlemen, and maybe a lady or two, is we are gonna unbox and build the new FMS P47. It's not new, this thing's been out for a while. So we're gonna take this thing out of the box. That's a lie. I've already taken it out of the box. This is just a big empty shell. This is one of them crazy boxes that like it opens up at the end and the whole thing is like 10 feet long and it's just a pain in the butt. So we're just gonna we're just gonna move this big retarded box out of the way because we already got the plane we already got the plane unboxed ha <laughs> all right so we got this big meat fat daddy fuselage I mean this thing is awesome. We got quick disconnects on the wings. Uh, it comes with, with pretty nice ordnance. We got our running lights, navigation lights, the doors on this thing. I mean, it's almost like fully covered. It's kind of like the Mustang. I really hope that E-Flight, 
you know, releases a P47 that has a lot of the features that we see uh, here in the, the FMS P47, I think right here where that aileron cuts off, that'd be a great place to have that snap off wing that you see and have this all be like one piece, you know, where it plugs into the, uh, into the fuse. I think that this would be an awesome addition to the 1500 Warbird series that E-Flight has going on. So we got two awesome wings, quick disconnect, so this should go together pretty easily. We've got our horizontal stabs. The vertical stab is molded into the fuse. Uh, like I said, it does include the Reflex V2 gyro. We have two wing spars. And it looks like uh, rather than being carbon spars, these may be fiberglass spars. Either way, it's fine with me. We got one longer one and a shorter one. So two, uh, you know, light colored, uh, what look like fiberglass spars for the wings. And we have a thinner carbon spar for the horizontal stab. We have our drop tank that goes in the underbelly. Two bombs, nice uh, little ordnance, and two uh, what look like rocket launcher pods for the uh, the wings. Now the rocket launchers and the center uh, drop tank, these all uh, like slide into place, right? So uh, they're easy on, easy off. The bombs, however, these guys uh, glue into place. So what we'll probably do is fit each of these with some rare earth magnets so I can pop them on for uh, static display and when I go to fly, we'll just take them off. All right, we've also got our prop hub. So two, uh, two plastic uh, shells for the prop hub. We've got our guns, uh, which are going to glue onto the front leading edge of each wing. We got our prop nut. Uh, the prop nut is plastic, but it does have a metallic threaded insert uh, inside there. So even though it's plastic, it should hold really well. We've got our four prop blades. And, you know, I'll tell you one of the things that that I don't really care for with this particular model, and I hear that it doesn't make that big of a difference, it still performs really well, is it's got what I consider to be a comically small propeller, and you guys will see that when we get, once we get the propeller strapped on. Uh, we've got, um, here we've got a, what looks like a pitot tube, as well as a RF antenna, and in this little baggie, Something that I have not seen in an FMS plane before, but I'm glad that it has it. We've got a USB-C cable that we can utilize to reprogram that Reflex G2 or V2 gyro in the event that the gyro um, becomes unusable, right? Or the airplane becomes unusable, because, I mean, let's face it, we all crash. So... In anticipation of the eventuality, or the inevitability really, that all foam aircraft have an expiration date, we just don't know what they are yet, they've given you what you need to reprogram that Reflex V2, which is great. Now something else that we're gonna be doing that's a little different is, uh, I mean, all you guys know that I'm a big fan of my Spectrum gear, my NX-8, well the NX-10, IX-12, I love the Spectrum transmitters, but for this airplane, because it has the Reflex Gyro, the Reflex Gyro accepts S-Bus inputs. So we're gonna be using an R168 Radio Master receiver and binding it up to our Radio Master TX-16S that you see here behind me. So a little bit different on that end. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and bust out the Ernst Super Stand. Or th this is the Ernst Ultra Stand. Go to rcairmarshal.com 
Click at BitGo Hobby and you can get your own Ernst Ultra Stand. So we're going to go ahead and throw the fuselage on here. We're going to put it on there upside down. Now this fuselage actually fits on here really nice. Awesome. We're going to go ahead and get started with the build. Now one of the other things that I think is really awesome about this model, just like the Mustang, um, the 1500 Mustang from E-Flight, as well as the 14, what is it, a 1450 and the 1700 Mustangs, it's got a retractable uh, tail wheel as well, which I think is awesome. Anytime, you know, companies do a retractable tail wheel uh, on these Warbirds, I mean, that's like an extra little touch of scale realism that I am a big fan of. So we're going to start by installing the horizontal stabs. So we're going to slide our spar in there. Get on in there, fool. All right. We got our spar installed. And let's see, I'm looking at the bottom. All right, and so far so good. That's just sliding right on in there, which is nice. I mean, it's a bit of a tight fit, but I'm not like having to, you know, pinch the foam in any kind of weird areas to get it to go on in there, uh, which I've had, you know, some issues with other planes where, you know, yes, it's a tight fit, but it's almost like you had to trim the foam. And while this is a tight fit, it's going right in. What's going on, Fred Barron, George Watts? George Watts, this is the one that will get repainted. So I'm not a big fan of the silver P47s, especially when we're talking Razorback P47s, which this one is. It's my favorite version of the P47. The bubble tops were more practical from a pilot's perspective, much better visibility, but I just like the looks of the Razorback, and since I don't have to sit in it, for me, this pilot, I like the Razorback. I think it's a cool looking airframe. Okay, so these are always a little bit tricky, not too bad. Because you gotta line up these, the elevators. There's uh, like the connector between the elevators. Now, you know, it's gonna look funny and all, but you know, one side has like a square insert and the other side has like a square rod that you have to put the rod into the hole. <laughs> <laughs> so you kinda gotta get them lined up and get uh, Get that started before you start like jamming that thing on in there. I'm gonna turn it around where the front of the plane is facing the camera so I can get a little better look at what I'm doing here. All right, it looks like, looks like we're engaged.
That's so cool. <laughs> Now this one on the other side is a bit tighter fit, but again, I mean they're they're sliding right in. Hmm. Not sure. I'm gonna flip it over because I'm sure we got a couple of screws that we're putting in from the top. Now, as with most FMS airplanes, uh, everything goes together with, uh, you know, it's a bunch of different size screws, but they are all two millimeter hex drives. So I've got my MIP two millimeter hex drive speed bits here, which are fantastic. Let's see. All right, we'll get some big long screws, which I have to assume are for the wings. We got some shorter screws. We got some little like nylon lock washers or lock nuts. And what looks like self tappers. Now these self tappers are Phillips head. And I think that's what we're gonna be using to hold our horizontal stab in. Now, you know, this is probably the one place where I'll break the book open to find out which of the things, now in the book it actually comes with an instruction manual for the Reflex V2, so that's pretty cool. Find out what hardware we use to attach the horizontal stab. It says KA 3.0 X15, so 15 millimeter, whatever a KA screw is. I have no idea what that means. I got nothing. So I assume it's the self tappers. So that's what we're going to use. The self tappers. Yep. That is correct, Fred. And that's why we're going to be using the Radio Master. I really like using the Radio Master um, when there's already a gyro in the airplane. And, you know, if, if nothing else, it's to make sure that, that I have, that I'm well versed in like all the different kind of uh, electronics that are out there so I can help people at the field. You know, because you never know when someone is going to ask a question about something that you may or may not have worked with before or really know anything about. And with the increasing popularity of the Radio Master stuff, it just seemed like the right thing to do to... Uh, to get one and learn OpenTX. But I have to say, I am no longer running OpenTX on my TX16S transmitter. I am running a new, I'm running new software in there called EdgeTX. So those of you that have a, uh, TX16S, one of the Radio Masters, or any of the um, 
the transmitters that support OpenTX. Uh, EdgeTX is a new fork of OpenTX, that open source project. It's a new fork of that open source project that is being readily supported and improved every day it's under very active development, uh, which is a little different than, than OpenTX has been in, say, the past year or so. There's only been like minor revision updates to OpenTX. And one of the nice parts about EdgeTX is that EdgeTX, as a version, well, actually, right from the start, EdgeTX now has full touchscreen support for the uh, the TX16S, the jumper, or not the jumper. Well, any of the transmitters that have a touchscreen, EdgeTX now supports that touchscreen. So you can modify your settings or sliders. You can just press whatever you want to select it. It's very neat. Like your model, model select tool uh, is very different than what it's looked like in the past. You know, there seems to be a lot of slop in the elevator from one side to the other. I don't really like that, so I want to see if I can find out what's going on here. Like, why don't we have better movement? Hmm. Hmm. I feel like I need to glue those together. Like I need to put a little dab of CA on there or something. For those that you guys have, uh, yeah, Wild Bill, there's a push rod on both sides. So there's a push rod on the left-hand side of the airframe that goes for the rudder and a push rod on the right side of the airframe for the elevator. And the two uh, elevator halves, so you guys can't see them right now, but the two elevator halves are paired together uh, you know, with like a rod that goes in between them. Yeah. So it looks like I'm going to need to throw some CA or something in here to better join up that center section. So like right there, uh, where the elevators pair together, there's like the square section that goes in here. And I just don't like the way that feels. Something ain't right. So let's see what I got in the old CA collection. How about some slow zap thick CA here? Hopefully this bottle is uh, not like <laughs> Okay. So I'm going to drop some thick CA down in there. And when we put these together, now this, this joiner here is plastic. And so I'm not too worried about, you know, the effects of the CA here in this plastic area, but I'm getting 
you know, the CA built up on all four sides of that square. I got a little bit of cure time here to work with. It doesn't set up right away. And I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't use any um, any kicker, like I said. And I'm just squaring up these elevators here in the back or getting them close enough so when that does finally set up, you know, they'll move together. And what I'm hoping for is that the CA there in the middle will be enough to keep the one, to keep the elevator on the left hand side from fluttering in flight. You know, if that glue joint breaks, that elevator will be able to flutter around and I don't really want that to happen. That would suck. So let's hope that doesn't happen. All right, we'll go ahead and get our screws in here. Awesome. We've got our two screws in place. So, we'll kind of kick this thing around sideways a little bit. Now, I assume that the longer wing spar goes towards the front and the shorter one goes in the back, but let's just make sure. Check the manual. See, Yeah, Bobby, man, these things are freaking cool, these uh, these screwdrivers. So you just kind of hold it in that little collar, and it just keeps going. And you pull that out, and it goes the other direction, right? So very neat tool. You find them at your local Lowe's hardware store. Sorry about the stupid dog. Awesome. So... In the, in the manual, it does not acknowledge that one spar is longer than the other. So I just assume longer spar in the front, shorter spar in the back. They are both the same diameter, so should be fine. Now something, I mean, again, not super concerning, but a little bit concerning is The spars are not very tight in the uh, in the fuse. They kind of wiggle around inside the you know the little spar um, little tunnel that they have in there, right? It just kind of jiggles around. That just seems <laughs> a little weird to me, right? Like I I figure that. If if I wanted tight tolerances somewhere, it'd be the wing spars. So, I'm just fitting that left wing in there now. The the channel in the wing feels pretty tight. So that's good. <clears throat> Awesome. Yep, now that fits in there gooten tight. Gooten tight. I'll tell you what, these wings 
are substantial. They've got some weight to them. I'm going to go ahead and screw down this wing. Now, something that you guys can't see right now is this reflex gyro, the battery tray. The way the battery tray is situated in here is different than like the way that they have it in the Mustang and the way that they've got it in the, uh, the Fock Wolf. So it actually, you know, because you've got such a huge, I mean, it's the jug, right? So this thing is crazy large. So for you guys that don't have one of these, I'm gonna tell you, that battery tray is going down at like a slant. You know, so rather than going straight in towards the bottom of the fuse, it goes, it slants down. You know, where the, the top of the battery is right around here and the bottom, you know, is is up there. I mean, it's, it's a neat design, I like that. All right, so we have some long, long screws here. And like I said, I'm pretty sure those are going to be for the wing. They have gone right on through there. So we're gonna grab our little power driver here and our two millimeter hex drive MIP speed bit. Speed bits are awesome. quick work out of these things instead of sitting here forever. All right, so we got those two in there. That way that wing doesn't slide out as I'm pushing the other one in. Oh, here we go. Get in there. Oh yeah. Beautimus. We'll get two more of these. Insano long screws. Now the screws do go in from the inside of the fuse because this is a, uh, the wings don't like strap into the bottom. They're kind of center mounted. On the fuselage. Awesome. So we've got our four wing bolts in and we're getting something that's starting to look like a big old P47 now. Look at that. All right, so the last bolts I got here are for the prop. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the prop assembled. We'll slide this thing out of the way because I am going to need my uh, this little guy. All right. So the prop blades, um, they do have the tips painted yellow, just the tips and they have decals uh, that go on the prop blades, you know, like the manufacturer's nomenclature that you usually see on uh, some of these 
uh, metal props on these warbirds. So you do have the option to, uh, to put those stickers on if you like. Now one of the things that I was kind of curious about, and if any of you guys have tried this before, I'd be curious to hear your results. So what I've been kind of toying around with the idea of doing is taking the props or the prop blades so this is a 14.8 and you guys will see here in a bit once I strap it onto the front of the plane it looks just comically small on this airframe right I really think this airframe needs just for scale sake it needs like a 16 17 inch prop to look scale so I'm trying to find, you know, if I can find them anywhere, um, some blades that will look a bit less silly, that will still mount to this same prop hub. So at one point in time, there was a Sky Raider that, um, Looked like they were very similar, but they were the kind of the size that I needed. It almost looks like the 1600 Corsair blades will fit on here, but I'm afraid they might be a little too big. <clears throat> we'll have to see. Okay, now each one of these little nylon lock nuts goes in there and we're just gonna tighten it down. I know you guys can't see what I'm doing here, but we're just throwing the those nylon lock nuts. Go into the back of the hub assembly. And the back of the hub assembly already has that hex pattern molded into it so the nuts will not back out on you while you're tightening down on them. Do the last one here. Awesome. Okay, so that is all of our blades installed. And this plane looks awesome. It's a little weird that the prop nut, it doesn't give you like a little hole or anything to be able to tighten it up with. But I'm going to turn the plane back around here facing the camera. And, you know, the Jug, the P-47, I mean, this is a huge airplane, right? And it just seems like that prop is just 
it needs to be like another inch longer. You know, I'd be super happy if this thing were like a 16 inch, 17 inch prop. I think it'd look fantastic with like a second, you know, like a 17 inch prop. So yeah, guys, no nuts were dropped in the making of this video. <laughs> All right, so it does look like there's a right side and a wrong side for the cannons. All right, and somewhere along the front of here, there should be a tiny hole where the pitot tube goes. We're gonna go ahead and drop our antenna into place. Now, the antenna, um, you know, is another one of those things that I'll leave in there for static display, but when I fly it, I take that out. Um, the guns, uh, if I glue them onto the wings, I'll probably glue them on with uh, foam tack, so they'll be easy to remove in the event that I have to replace the wings or in the, you know, when the inevitable happens and I run this thing into a tree, or, you know, the trees do what they normally do at my field and they just reach out and grab the plane and just draw it in, like, come to your mom and they they just take it <laughs> they just take the airplane all right something i'm excited to see in this version of the p47 is it does have an ec5 battery connector awesome ec5 I'm cutting into midget porn time. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Okay, so I'm just kind of looking at all of the different stuff that we got going on here with this reflex module. Here's everything that would plug in. So normally this would be our mode selector, but we are going to be running SBUS in. So we need SBUS. So that means that we should not need any of these other four. So we're gonna unplug them all. So this should be aileron, elevator, throttle, and rudder, and they are. So we don't need those four connections because S bus is beautiful and we just need one connection going over to the reflex from the R168. So that will go up here at the top. All right, so we got that plugged in. And we also have our flap and gear, which are the only additional connectors. So we get our, we're gonna get our aileron, elevator, throttle, and rudder through S-Bus into the receiver. That all goes through the reflex uh, gyro unit out to their respective control surfaces. So that means that the only thing that we're hooking up individually is our flap and our gear. So as always, gear is going to be channel five. Hmm. 
Hmm. Is that right? <laughs> to the brown is down. Hmm. Hey, for you guys, I'm going to wait to do this until I see some answers. For you guys that are familiar with the old style Futaba um, servo connectors that had like the little blade, the little polarizing blade on one side of the connector. Yeah, I know, it's a mad dog. So which side of the connector is that blade on, on Futaba? Is it on the ground side of the connector or the signal side of the connector? Does anybody know the answer to that? Is George Watts still in here? George Watts is a Futaba guy, huh? or used to be. Matt M, Rich M, Futaba people. Which side of the servo connector is that blade on? Okay, the blade is on the signal side. All right, got it. Okay. So that's one, two, three, four, channel five. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And then oh, that was by Flaps. Flaps is channel six. And my landing gear, you know, if they don't work, I'll flip it upside down. Landing gear goes into channel five right here. <laughs> All right. So here's the battery tray. For those of you guys that are familiar with like the 1500 Mustang and the FW190 from E-Flight, this uses the same type of battery tray because those are, surprise, also made by FMS. So there's a lot of common features between those different aircraft when you're looking at the aircraft from FMS and the aircraft from E-Flight that are made by FMS. We're gonna go ahead and strap a battery in here. For testing purposes, we're just basically gonna put this thing right in the center of the tray. I'm not that worried about CG and all that fun stuff right now. Because we just want to get everything kind of up and running. But I do want to go ahead and have it on the tray because that just makes things a little easier to manage. So we've got that in there the way that we want it. Let me go ahead and grab the TX16S here. We're gonna do some uh, super Switch quick. Button. Welcome to Edge TX. Welcome to Edge TX. All right.
So, oh my goodness, you shut up, lady. All right. Select model. Create model. Go. <laughs> okay. AETR is good. Number five. Okay, so this is our inputs. Nope, we're going to set that up in the mix. So for channel five, we're going to edit mix name. Channel five, grr. All right, so this is the boring part, and I do apologize. The source for gear is going to be SF. That is good. And channel six flaps. Flap. Sorry, I actually like spell stuff out and give things names and all that fun stuff. Flaps. <gasps> Okay, and the source is going to be this switch right here. Oh, that Amazon lady. Okay. All right, and then we're going to add a widget to the home screen. And the widget is going to be outputs. First channel is channel one, that looks great. Okay. Okay, so the gear's working, rudder's working. Throttle's working, that's working, and what about my flaps is also working, yes. <laughs> I get excited when I do these, like these open TX things right, because I just, I suck with these things, so, you know. I get excited when I program the right way and everything works the way I expect it to. So hopefully we'll get this thing bound up and get the uh, S bus 
working. That should all work like right out of the gate. And then we're going to go into model internal RF multi FR sky <gasps> FR sky D16 correct correct and bind So I don't know if I'm putting it into bind mode properly. I don't know if you have to like be holding the button while you plug in the battery or if you can plug in the battery and then push the button. I forget how to do it on these things. Yep, that must be how you do it. Now we're gonna bind up. So now, now I think we're good. Thing. is working let's see if we can get that gear down because I know that's that's why I think everybody hangs out right everybody hangs out in these build videos oh my god look at this thing it's all just working not the fastest servos I've ever seen, but they move very scale-like, and I do appreciate scale fidelity. So I'm going to go ahead and line up the control rod on this thing. Woo! What an awesome airplane. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to line up the control rod for the elevator and go ahead and get that connected. You know, so I always wait when I'm doing any of these planes that don't have, and I know y'all can't see me, but I think you can still hear me, right? I mean, I can't see the screen, so. Oh man, that looks good. <laughs> Ow. Something bit me. There we go. So now our ball links are all done. All the ball links for the ailerons are already uh, done for you. Now we'll go ahead and get this thing flipped back over and get this stand out of the way and set this thing down 
on the table. Whoa. It's got a wide, wide stance on the landing gear. All right, guys. So there it is. The FMS 1500 millimeter P47. This does have the reflex gyro. Uh, it looks like it's got either similar or the same tires uh, that you'll find on the E-Flight P51 Mustang. So they are uh, quite hard, right? That's what she said. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and say it. Oh, yeah. but they also have the bearings that the P51 has. So if the same kind of little hack works for this, uh, and I'll have to talk with Ryan about it. I think it may have been Jerry Wilfong who gave Pilot Ryan the idea to use some Robart tires, or maybe, I think it was Robarts, but there's a set of Robart tires that you can take right off of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm wanting to do, is take these uh, really hard tires off there and put those Robarts on there. Because it looks like the same hubs that they use on the P51 on here. Now, I want to show you guys the retracts on this thing, because I think that they kind of steal the show. Now, we do have our navigation lights. I don't know if you guys can see the navigation lights on the left and the right. But these retracts are fantastic. So let me see if I can like hold the plane and flip a switch all at the same time. Uh-oh, we're dropping stuff. Apparently the answer is no. I cannot hold the plane and flip a switch at the same time, but check these things out. I mean, look how clean that closes up. And then if you pay attention to the back when we open them back up, I mean, the back opens up. These things are so sweet. <laughs> that makes me happy. Uh-oh, we're knocking guns off. I better put this thing down before I drop it and break it, and then I'll be all upset and sad and mad at myself. Awesome. So, awesome plane. Super excited to have it in the, the fleet. The squadron, if you will. Now, this plane will be getting a paint job. Yeah, so I need to reverse the rudder. Uh, surprisingly, that's, uh, well, I gotta reverse the, the landing gear too, but the flaps are already moving in the right direction. Ailerons are already moving in the right direction. Elevator's are already going in the right direction, so I will need to reverse the rudder, and I'll need to reverse the landing gear channel, but that's it. So, super excited. Uh, this thing went together pretty easy, as you guys saw. Uh, of course, my big mouth just runs and runs, so uh, I make it look much longer than it is in reality. Yes, now the trees are waiting. Yes, I know, lady, telemetry has been lost. So, Radio Master TX-16S bound up to, sorry, I think the Amazon people are here. So the dogs are just gonna go buck wild for a little bit. They're gonna jump and yell at the door. Amy's still in Tennessee, right? So we don't have anybody upstairs like wrangling the dogs like we do in the normal shows. So we've got our Radio Master R168 receiver. We've only got three wires plugged in there. We've got our S bus that goes out to that reflex gyro. So our throttle, aileron, elevator, and rudder 
all plug into the reflex gyro. Our mode switch for the reflex, um, as well as all the inputs into the reflex, are all coming in via S bus. And on channel five and channel six, we've got our gear and our flap plugged directly into the R168. So very cool, it makes for a very clean installation instead of just having wires all over the place. I'm not a big fan of having wires everywhere. Uh, so we'll have a much cleaner install. And let's see, I already mentioned it comes equipped with an EC5 connection and that is on an 80 amp uh, Predator ESC. Um, I am pretty sure that we're running Metal Gear servos all around. Your elevator and rudder servos are inside the fuse. And you've got, you know, your ailerons and your flaps as well as your uh, navigation lights are all uh, made it up to the fuse with quick disconnects, which are proprietary. I've never seen anything like that before. It's not like what you see in the E-flight planes. It's little metal pins. Uh, they're in a few of the different FMS models out there. So if you've seen those in the past, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it does have the battery tray similar to your, uh, your P-51, your Focke Wolf, uh, as well as like your 1700 millimeters of these planes. So if you've seen that FMS battery tray before, you kind of already know what that looks like and what to expect there. Uh, the only um, gluing that I had to do, um, you know, you do have to glue the accessories on, so you would have to glue on your guns. If you don't want those to fall out, you'd have to glue on your antenna. Uh, like I said, I usually don't put the antenna in there for keeps. I keep it there for static display, and then when I fly, I take it out, or when I'm transporting it. So the only glue I had to use, right, was when I was assembling that horizontal stab, where the two stabs mate together, uh, where the, you know, at the, at, the, at the pivot point of the rudder, you know, the two, the two uh, horizontal stabs will mate together. That square post, it didn't feel very good. It didn't feel very tight. So I put a big old blob of thick CA in there, pushed them together. So now they are in there forever. Uh, but everything else looks great. The build went really easy. It was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight screws total. And then you got four more to hold the prop in. So, what do you guys think? FMS P47, 1500 millimeter. I think it's a beautiful airplane, but like I said earlier, I don't think that the Razorbacks should be silver. And I certainly don't think that it should have these weird, like big kind of fake invasion stripes on it. The, the invasion stripes just don't look right. I mean, they're not really invasion stripes. It's like decorative. Um, so what I am going to be doing is painting this up in a, you know, in the green uh, European theater scheme. Um, you know, so like a green camo, gray underbelly. Uh, we're gonna do something fancy. We're not using any particular uh, scheme. We're gonna have a custom um, pinup girls to go on the sides of the cowling. And everything about the airplane is gonna look very, uh, you know, custom for what we're doing. Uh, we're going to have a special name that we're going to have along the side of the, uh, the fuselage right here. And I think that you guys are going to get a big kick out of it. We're also going to have, you know, so this, this was a Pacific Theater uh, P-51, so it's got a lot of Japanese stuff on it. We're going to turn this into a European Theater uh, P-47. 
and we're gonna have us some little Nazis, some little Nazi stuff on here. Cause P-47s were good at two things, going fast and killing Nazis. <laughs> right? And I just think that there were a, a lot more Razorbacks in the, uh, in the European theater than there were in the Pacific. The silver bubble top P-47s, that's where I, I prefer and like to see the, pill, the silver P-47s is in the bubble top. So it will not be named the Angry Dragon. It is going to be named the Crowd Knocker. <laughs> it's going to be named the Crowd Knocker. Shut up, dog. All right. Or actually, it's going to be called the Crowd Knockers. Uh, because our pinup girl, she's uh, she's going to be full frontal exposed. It's going to be awesome. So classic style, naked World War II pinup girl. I'm super excited, you know. But first, before we do any of that, we're going to take this thing out to the field and we're going to fly it around to make sure that it performs as expected. And I mean, the thing just feels amazing. Um, so I'm pretty sure it's gonna fly great. I don't suspect we're gonna have any kind of issues with the flight characteristics. Now, something else that I'll throw out there is, and you guys can't see it, but we may be able to, you know, because I can take the canopy off and zoom in the camera, we can kind of manipulate this a little bit, maybe, the pilot looks like crap, and they always do. But the cockpit, like the instruments, look sweet in this thing. Can y'all see that? Like the instrument panel? Probably not. And that sucks. But the instrument panel, and even like the sidewalls, you know, it's got like the throttle lever on the sidewalls. It's got the control yoke, or the, con no, it doesn't have the control stick, so the guy just looks like he's holding on to something. But like the side panels have all kinds of little scale detail and stuff on them. The, the instrument panel, you know, I can't get the glare off of there, but you can, you can kind of see all the little gauges on the instrument panel. I mean, that... That's, that's really, that's like molded, you know, scale plastic and stuff in there. And it's all like period appropriate colors, that uh, seafoam green, you know, kind of uh, appearance. And we'll, we'll back out the camera. So JCB67 is asking, is this the real livery for that plane? Yes, for the Bonnie airplane this is the livery for the body airplane but we are changing the livery on this airplane to um i don't know i call it more of a conceptual thing right like our um My idea here is to go with something that wasn't used on any other P-47s, to have a full, customized, you know, World War II-inspired uh, paint scheme, but it doesn't really, it's not a, a replica of anything. Uh, so we're going to have our own, you know, tail numbers. We're going to have our own, you know, squadron designators. We're just going to make stuff up. So we're going to be getting in touch with Cali. Have Callie do up some some special Cali graphics for us uh, to make sure that you know we have all the appropriate um, like nomenclatures and the stars and bars and the tail numbers are going to be you know what we want them to be. Um, we're going to have our pinup girl on the front. We're going to have the name of the airplane, so the crowd knockers, and then we're also going to have some Nazi. Some Nazi badges, and of course, 
whoever this guy is has to have at least five Nazi badges because he's obviously an ace pilot, right? So, I mean, this guy was a freaking. So this is uh, Bill Dunham. And it looks like he had a lot of Japanese kills. Yeah, thanks, guys. I, I love this airplane, man. I think this thing looks great. I've always been a huge fan of the P-47. I think FMS, you know, did a, a awesome job with this airplane. I do hope, you know, for the sake of humanity and all that is good, that, man, this dog, he just won't stop. <laughs> I don't even know that he knows what he's barking at, right? So we're going to have, yeah, I hope, I hope that E-Flight releases this as a, in their 1.5 meter Warbird line at some point in the game. I think this would be an awesome addition. They would have to redesign the wings a little bit. But I don't think that'd be a problem. I think that those guys, if anybody can figure it out, I think that they can. They probably have to modify the center section, you know, a bit where instead of the center section like bolting in, they probably have to make that whole underbelly kind of one piece and it all just kind of bolts in from the bottom. Uh, and then the wings, you know, slide on. But I think that this would be an awesome addition to the E-Flight um, 1.5 meter lineup along with the Fock Wolf and the P-51. I mean, obviously FMS already has a mold for it and we'll go ahead and set it out, you know, with the front kind of facing you guys again. So you can see like that, what I just think is a comically small propeller on such a huge airplane, but my understanding is that the, the plane gets up and goes just fine. It, it hauls the mail with this propeller on here. I just would like it to be a little bit longer, um, you know, especially when we have like, I don't know. I mean, I guess you are like in danger of a prop strike if you, if you tilt the front down too much. Um, you know, with a 16 inch, yeah, maybe, maybe it's fine. Maybe this is scale, but it just looks so small. It looks so small. <laughs> All right. Yes. So, that's the build, guys. Does anyone have any questions before we, uh, before we wrap it up? So we're gonna, uh, you know, go ahead and wrap things up with the build video. If anybody has any questions, if you're watching this later and you have any questions, if there's anything that you wanna see, um, you know, up close, uh, what I can do is, you know, leave me, um, a question down in the comments in the video and if you want like specific pictures of something follow me on Instagram my link in Instagram is down below in the in the uh, in the description <laughs> so check the description the link to my Instagram is down in the description you can also find a link to my Instagram at rcairmarshall.com as well as links to all of my affiliate partners where they carry all the products that you need to change your RC life. Yes, I still got to finish that Dr. Pepper. I may have already, I don't remember. So, yep, if you have any questions, if you want to see anything up close, let me know. I can zap pictures off of anything that you want to see. Leave them down in the comments what you want to see. 
and I will take pictures and I'll post them up on my Instagram account so you guys can go over there, follow me on Instagram, and you can check out the pictures there. But otherwise, for the live audience, yeah, Guniak, dude, I love this thing. I'm a huge fan of P-47s, and I just love this airplane. This thing is great. It's so much better than the Dynam P-47 that I had before that I've already given the Dynam P-47 away, and this is now... Because, number one, I don't really like bubble-top P-47s. That just doesn't scream P-47 to me. P-47s, you know, I just think they look so sharp as a Razorback. So that's what we got. We've got the Razorback and, you know, this is just what, this is what a P-47 was supposed to look like. But like I was saying earlier, I don't really like also the fact that they have a Razorback that was a Pacific Theater airplane that was covered in silver paint. I think that the Pacific Theater airplanes were silver and they were bubble tops. The Razorbacks are green camo. So this one's getting the green camo treatment. <laughs> Micah, that's interesting. I haven't seen a P-47 in a clipped wing bubble top. That might look pretty cool. Yeah, I do like the P-39 Era Cobra. Unfortunately, I don't think that they're going to be selling that from E-Flight anymore. I believe you can still get it as an FMS model, however. So if you still want a P-47, or I'm sorry, a P-39, I think you can still get an Aerocobra from FMS. That's the same mold as the old E-Flight. It's just a different paint scheme. All right. So one question that somebody asked, I think it was either JCB or EQ, uh, whoever it was, you may have left. But if you come back and watch this later on, I'm going to tell you the answer to the question that you had earlier. So someone had asked, how do I change the modes on the reflex gyro? All right, when I'm plugged in everything through SBUS, and I, I want to check the manual here real quick to make sure that I'm not completely full of bull. Do, 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 do. All right, so I have S bus in. I think, so it doesn't say. Three flight mode positions are stable, are available. This is controlled with a two or three position switch on the transmitter. When assigned to a two position switch, it switches between stabilized and optimized modes. Stabilized mode is designed for beginners. So stabilized mode is gonna be like you're self-leveling, you're safe. And then your optimized mode is going to be like your AS3X, just your standard stabilization. Um, and then off. SBUS PPM. Connect the three wire into SBUS. Ensure that the polarity is correct. The default channel assignment is aileron, elevator, throttle, rudder, and mode switch. Well, yeah. 
but mode switch is not on channel 5. So, I'm going to have to play around with where the mode switch is set up to respond to, and that may be something that's actually part of the computer programming. So I'm going to continue setting a switch to different channels until I can get the mode to change. Uh, it doesn't say what channel, like when you set it up in SBUS, what channel do I need to output from the transmitter to get the mode switch to change. So I do not know the answer to that. I'll have to figure that out. I'll have to just play around with it, but it's not something that I'm going to do here. Um, it could be on channel 7 that it responds to your mode switch. It could be on channel 9. Um, through SBUS, I kind of hope that it's on channel 9. So like with an 8-channel receiver, you can use all your PWM outputs and then have a ninth channel as your gyro mode selector, but you know, I don't, I don't get to control that. But I think within the Reflex programming software, I can probably change where I want uh, the mode switch, like what channel I want the mode switch to respond to. So I'll play around with it and I will, uh, I will let you guys know. I just, I don't know the answer to that right now. So, Sorry, guys. Anyway, I'm going to head out of here. Uh, be sure to tune in in an hour and 15 minutes so you guys can go do your dinner, take a power nap. Make sure you get up at 1015 Eastern or 715 Pacific to uh, tune in to Mr. Guniak's show. He probably doesn't have the link built for it, but that's okay. And, uh, and we're going to go ahead and call it a night here with the P47 Live Build. Check the link in the description if you're looking for a link of where you can buy your very own P47. Uh, they do show out of stock right now, but just keep checking that link and you will find it again. For all the people that came to hang out, I appreciate it. We will see you all on Friday. Have a good night, guys.